Hello and welcome to part two of the Learn E4 series. Do you find that you are fairly comfortable against moves like E5 and C5, the two main lines, but you struggle when they play some alternative such as the French Defense or the Scandinavian or the Karakhan or some other system against E4? Or maybe it's the case that you are sort of just wanting to deepen your understanding of E4 and just want to know, well, have a complete repertoire with the white pieces. Well, whatever your situation is, this is the video for you. Now, if you are quite new to E4 and maybe are just wanting to learn it for the first time, I would recommend checking out the part one video first because you are going to probably face E5 and C5 more often than all of the moves combined that we will see in this video. Now, it's good to be ready for the less common moves as well because you are going to face them sometimes. And to start with, we're going to see the game between Fedor Chuk against Legki from the Paris Championship 2014. And before I share with you my special system against the French defense to get a small advantage, make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and definitely subscribe by hitting that red button. So here there's actually two different approaches you can go for that I think are quite interesting. Well, not just two, but the two main ones are either to play to move knight d2 or to play to move knight to c3. And probably most of you all think the move knight c3 would be a more natural move to play, and it is indeed the main line. To play knight c3, you have to be ready for basically two major branches. You have to be ready for the move knight f6, which is the classical lines, which can lead to a quite close center with e5, knight d7, and you know, this line with f4 is a Steinitz variation, where white gets this nice grip over the center, but black is going to... Try to create counterplay either in the center or potentially on the queen side, leading to some quite unbalanced and interesting play. And there's also another very unbalanced system known as the Winnower, which by the way is a system with Bishop B4 that actually Bobby Fischer struggled against in some of his games while he was an active player at the top of the chess world. And usually in the Winnower, Black's idea is that after something like E5, that, well, compared to Knight 6, Black has not lost time moving the Knight from F6 to D7, as it were. So black gets an ec5 a little more quickly. But the price is this bishop is not ideal on b4. And with the move a3, white can now make the argument that these double pawns, while they might be a little bit of a weakness, that white does also have a space advantage and does have a nice bishop pair advantage with the unopposed bishop on c1 also potentially being particularly strong. So you can play knight c3, and this is actually the approach that I recommend in my play e4 like Ikara course, if you want to go deeper there um it's actually recommend a few different shortcuts that you can play that are a little bit different to the main lines i showed you but i don't want to give away all of my secrets here you can check the link in the description if you want a more deep and a more thorough repertoire based on the games of the world's best play blitz play on chess.com hikaru nakamura uh so there is also the approach that fedorchuk played with knight to d2 and if you find these lines like knight f3 or and bishop b4 annoying then that is why i would probably recommend to because the point is that obviously bishop b4 is kind of silly when white can just go c3 and kick the bishop yeah but if they go knight to f6 this is also not as good i think compared to the version with knight c3 so what is the difference you might be asking with the knight being on d2 versus knight being on c3 here well, the difference is that we can build a very solid pawn chain with the move c3. So that when they go c5 and when they attack our center, well, we just play this very nice knight move. Uh, well, I don't know if you saw this move, by the way, of knight to e2, which is make sure our pawn is very well defended. If they go queen b6, we have knight f3 to keep that pawn safe. And just get a small and very position pleasant positional advantage with quite natural moves here, you know, castling and bishop f4 and, and so on and so forth. So... In any case, basically the best move for black here is one I think is one that's not so likely for your opponents to find if they are not already familiar with the theory. And knight two is already a kind of move that is mostly seen at the professional level, or at least among very experienced players. So if you're playing as, let's say, at an 18 high level and below, your opponents might already be starting to think a bit at this point. But the best move for black is to play to move c5 and try to get a more open center. And there are different move orders you can try, you know, the main line in the past has been ed5 and going for these positions after say ed5 knight f3 where you try to you know basically play against the isolated pawn that will be coming whether you take on c5 or they take on d4 i mean at some point you know these pawns are going to get traded one way or another 
Though one tip I would give is it's probably better to wait for them to move their bishop first and then take. Just so it's being a second move. Moving the bishop it is allowed to get a bit more of an initiative in the position. Uh, but the, maybe the reason why e d5 is not quite as popular these days as it used to be is because of queen d5. Where there are these lines where they can sort of resolve the tension in the center and try to reduce their problems in this way with some exchanges. So you can play move knight f3 and sort of keep the tension instead. So that if they play cd4, well, you can take back with the knight and sort of make the argument that you've got a little bit of a lead in development. Of course, with black plays correctly, you can gradually neutralize it and keep white's edge to an absolute minimum. But okay, you've got knight c6, bishop b5, and you are still keeping a little bit of pressure, thanks to your pieces being a little more active in this position. But I think it's slightly more significant than the fact that black has a central majority at present. So anyway, that's kind of the story of how these positions play out. And of course, there is the way that was played in the game, where black played d takes e4, the Rubenstein variation. And by the way, it's a move that could also arise just as easily via the move knight to c3 and d4 in this version. So you kind of have to be ready for it whether you decide to play knight c3 or knight to d2. But in any case, in this position, what I've noticed is that most of my opponents, when I play this in uh, in online blitz and bullet they like to play the move knight f6 it's only the most common move at the amateur level and at the online level so while at the grandmaster level you're going to see moves like knight d7 and this kind of thing let's say you know with bishop d3 and this more often you know in these knights why can often go for a long castling and then when black Carl's short you go for a nice king side attack it can lead some quite sharp and interesting play and of course there are quite an approach with castling short if that is more to your taste but the move knight f6 is the one you're probably going to face the most often in from my experience. And so how would you deal with the tension between the knights? What would you play here as white? Maybe you can write in the comments below, given that it's only move 5. Well, uh, the answer is that knight f6 is the most natural move. Because whichever way black takes back is a bit of a concession. You'd be amazed how many times I've caught out opponents with this trap of knight f3. Well, my opponents will play some random move like bishop d6 and after bishop d3, most of my opponents for some weird reason don't play the move h6, but instead they play something like castles or some other random developing move. Not realising that with the move bishop g5, white simply wins the queen by force. I've got out a lot of players raid right below 1800 with this idea, so it might also help you to get some quick wins as well. And that's kind of the reason why gf6 I guess is a little more common, but uh, at least at high levels of play. But you're also really weakening his structure quite a lot. And I have to admit the way that Fedorchuk plays as white is an approach that I actually wasn't familiar with before I did my research for this video. But it turns out that bishop e3 is a really interesting move order. Where you're just making it very hard for black to free his center with c5. Because now the bishop is covering it yes or yes. And now after the move b6 play in the game. Well white just plays very dynamically with queen f3. Showing that well we're not limited to just going knight f3 queen d2 castles. Which might be the normal way to develop. But we can even be a lot more aggressive and just get a massive lead in development here with long castles. So after the moves bishop b7, bishop c4, knight d7, and after some natural developing moves, you may be wondering, well, what exactly is the plan for white in a position like this? Because, yeah, white has a big lead in development, but how exactly do we take advantage of it? Well, white's next move is just perfect for really leaving black in a completely lost position here. Granted, there are actually several moves technically that win for white, but the most convincing is the one white played with queen to d to h5. Just pinning this pawn, so you're threatening to play bishop takes e6, and black can't cast out of it because then the f7 pawn is hanging here. So black plays the move queen d6, but now after knight f4, we see that black has a very unpleasant choice between either letting go of the one of these pawns with the pins, or playing king e7 and, you know, Okay, black has not lost material immediately, but look at this king on e7. There's no way it's surviving against all of white's pieces being involved in the attack this fast. And after bishop g7, the game just continued very abruptly. With the move d5 just crashing through and using that open e-file. The point being that after cd5, which was played in the game by the way. The white simply goes bishop takes, realizing that black is not able to win material. Because if e takes d5, clearly bishop to c5 and... You know, we just win the queen with the discovered attack, as it were. And otherwise, well, black's just getting killed. Uh, the game concluded with uh, queen takes uh, queen to c7. 
But then why just crash this through again for ship e6? We really don't care about sacrificing a piece when A, the king is wide open, and B, they're not even able to take the knight because after king e6 again, just bishop takes b6 and we win back all our material and still have a completely decisive attack against the black king, yeah? So in the game after queen e5, white finished it off with the move bishop to c5, which with a discovered attack we win the queen and we're just going to be up a whole lot of material uh, just to play it out for you. Bishop c5 takes, rook takes e5, and at the end this knight takes g7, white is just up a queen and two pawns for bishop and rook. And that is why black resigned after bishop to c5. So a pretty convincing game to start off with. And I think you'll agree that this gives a lot of confidence. Knowing that whether we play knight d2 or knight c3. That we will get a small advantage. I mean, you're probably going to have a slightly bigger advantage with free knight c3. If you know what you're doing. But it's a little bit more work to, to get the hang of compared to knight d2. But if you do want to master knight c3 again. You can check out the play for like Ikaro course in the description. Where I do give a full repertoire and go into a lot of detail in terms of mastering these positions for white. Moving on to the next game. This one is a nice one for showing a very simple yet very effective system for dealing with the Scandinavian defense. Because one thing to keep in mind is that if you're playing at higher levels, let's say 2000 plus, you're probably going to face the Karakhan more often than the Scandinavian. But below 1800, I would say that, or let's say below 2000, I think you're more likely to face D5. So let's start with that. And see how it played out in this game between Jan Kristof Duda against Vladislav Artemiev in a tournament in 2020. This was, I believe, a blitz game, or at very least a rapid game, if I'm not mistaken. And so after ed5, queen d5 was played. Uh, now black can play to move knight f6 as well, and choose to take on d5 with the knight instead of the queen. But in that case, we can actually play a very similar sub to what we're going to see after queen d5. That is, we can just play, for example, bishop to e2 castle and just basically take over the center with c4. This is basically the setup that white is aiming for in these positions to have this up with the pawn side by side on c4 d4. Our king side very comfortably developed and the knight coming to c3 from there. It's a pretty easy setup to remember and we're going to see it in the lines after queen takes d5 as well by the way with white delaying the move knight c3 until after the move c4 has been played so that the structure remains as flexible as possible. Now it is true, there are more critical ways to play. For example, later on you may decide to upgrade your repertoire by playing c4 and showing that in certain lines you can benefit from delaying the move bishop e2 in favour of more aggressive plans like c5, for example. But it's not something that you really need to know in order to be successful with 1e4 as white. Now in the game, black goes queen d5, and well, you may be familiar with the fact that if you have some experience with e4, so the main line is to go knight c3 and then whichever way the queen goes to play d4 knight f3 and of course it's a very natural way to play and probably objectively the strongest. But it's also a line where black kind of gets to choose his system like he chooses where he wants to put the queen and you know whether he wants to go for a bishop f5 sap or a c6 sap or a bishop g4 sap. So it's a line where you kind of have to do a bit of research to kind of get the advantage over the opponent and it's also kind of the reason why they play the Scandinavian in a way to get these sorts of thematic sort of developments. Uh, whereas with knight f3 we kind of set up a position where if they play their normal Scandinavian setups like knight f6, c6 and, and bishop out then we actually get a very big advantage let me show what I mean with an example uh, our team didn't play knight f6 in the game but just to demonstrate let's say we play bishop e2 and they play say bishop g4 pinning the knight and after the move our castles they play c6 or e6 just trying to be very solid and then they go c6, just playing just their usual Scandinavian setup. But then we have the move c4 in this position, and we can see here that after, say, queen to d6, uh, a knight c3, that white just has a very clear advantage in this position. Because black is going for a setup that is kind of not very effective when white's got the pawns on c4, d4. It's a very clear space advantage, and you know, a lot of good ways to play this. I mean, I would probably just go h3, kick that bishop back, and maybe play... Well, even just something like rook e1, bishop e3, even just very natural developing moves give you a clear advantage here, yep. So, in the game, black goes for bishop g4, and he tries to disrupt white's usual plan of going bishop e2. And with knight 6, he's trying to make it hard for white to get in d4 and c4 in a good version. Now, I mean, you can still play d4 and c4, but you are 
kind of asking for Black to sort of go for this attack on your pawn, and it is aligning where if Black knows what he's doing, then he is sort of having a, a quite reasonable position. So my suggestion is to be a little bit tricky with the move order, and I find that this move H3 is maybe the most unpleasant one for Black and the way for White to achieve a small advantage. The idea is that after takes, takes that, well, we managed to get the bishop pair and we also attack their queen. We're going to see how that plays out in the game. But if they play to move bishop to h5, we actually kind of move order him a little bit. Where now, it turns out you have a much better version of the d4, c4 idea when you have thrown in this h3, bishop, e5. Because now if they play castles with the same idea of piling every piece against a d4 pawn... Now c4 works a lot better than before because, you see, if we go back to this position, if white goes c4, it's quite important for black to play to move queen to f5. He needs to put the queen on this square specifically so that he can have ideas like attacking this d4 pawn and potentially being able to win it with some tactical ideas. But here we can see a difference that black doesn't have queen f5 because g4 simply wins the bishop, yeah, with the fork. But after queen d7, well, you just go d5, you're just pushing through in the center. Uh, actually, it's possible that playing g4 and then d5 might be technically even stronger. But we see that black's piece again pushed back and that white just has more or less a decisive initiative with these different attacking moves at his disposal. Uh, so, so, yeah, basically this is the reason why bishop h5. It's a very natural move and maybe you would face it more often at a lower level of play, but it is actually a big mistake. It's very important for black to take and then it's very important also... For black to play queen e6 and to try to exchange the queens. Uh, but after queen e2, I think that this ending is still very slightly better for white. After, let's say, queen e2, bishop e2. I mean, black gets some space in the center, but, you know, it's very easy to play, like, d3, c3 castles. And, I mean, it's a mission I've played with black, and I found it, even though the engine says that it's somewhat close to equal, I think that really white does have quite a nice advantage. And if they play a move like knight d4, you can get this kind of funny pawn structure with uh, queen takes e6, knight f3, and... and okay, it's kind of a weird position. Both sides have doubled pawns. And okay, to be fair, the position is quite close to equal, but you could still make the argument that white's play with, you know, getting the, the knight on the e4 outpost is still slightly more straightforward somehow. So as a worst case line, it is not so bad. It's also interesting to point out, by the way, that there's also this move knight c3 that was recommended by, uh, well, given as an old term suggestion by... Gawain Jones in his uh, his Coffeehouse Rep 12 Volume 1. It can be an interesting old time to just explore if you want to surprise your opponent, but for now I'm going to stick with the game continuation with Take Take and a move Queen D7 that was played in the game. But Queen E7 kind of gives you a better version of the positions we saw with Queen E6 because now the difference is that, well, White didn't play Castles, he played Knight C3 for some weird reason in the game. I don't think White's move order was necessarily the best one. But the general point still remains that with this bishop here, it's very easy to go for a pawn storm and tap a strong attack against the black king. Uh, I'm a bit surprised black didn't go e5 and just take the full center. Instead, Artemia played a more passive e6. And I'm going to go for the rest game quite quickly because I think that it's perhaps not the most uh, accurate play by both sides. But I guess that's blitz for you. So 97 castles. Again, I think this is a bit of a weird maneuver compared to just a normal knight f6 and... More of rook b1, why is already thinking about playing b4 and opening up the king, queen side for black's king. Whereas because black lacks the space to, uh, well, to kind of attack on the king side, you know, with f5 and this sort of thing. It means white's attack is just so much faster and, of course, black's moves are not the most precise. But still, we can see how the attack kind of plays out. You know, a4 and we're going to try to win the bishop. After h4, white plays a move a3, continuing to go after the bishop, which... Actually, it turns out to be a mistake. It's probably a lot better here to not let Black open up the queen king side in any way. Just play g4. Keep the king side closed and this pawn stuck here. And then, you know, this would give white the advantage still. But white goes a5 instead. And after this, Black actually missed a nice opportunity to come back into the game. Which is kind of the reason why this game perhaps is not the single best one I could choose. But uh, in terms of, let's say you know, the most accurate kind of play, but still we can't see very clearly what the players are aiming for. So black could actually have played the move bishop f2. Uh, well done if you saw this piece sack. The idea is that if we play, let's say, king takes f2 trying to defend, well, black can take and suddenly you actually can't play knight takes g3. You have to play king g2 and kind of let the attack run on. Because if you take, then what black can do is they can play 
the move queen to d4, and it turns out the attack is just way too strong. After knight g3 takes queen h4, then yeah, I mean, black is just bring all the pieces into the attack, why it's not really finding the time to bring peace into the defense, and you know, with moves like knight d4, queen h2 coming, it's just a completely lost position for white, in fact. Uh, despite only having two pawns for the piece, the attack is too strong. But fortunately for Duda, Artemiev did not see this opportunity. He played the move bishop d4. Fair enough, White still played the move c3 again, giving black perhaps a second chance, but I guess it's not as effective when the c3 square is covered and you don't have queen d4 at the end, yeah? So in the game, black goes hg3 and he sacks a piece this way, but by contrast, the attack is not as strong. And after queen to d4. Well, White decides to play the move a6, just kind of ripping open the king in this way. Though again, it turns out it's technically a mistake and White should have just played the move bishop to b2. Now, we're actually not afraid if they take d3 because trading queens is very good for us to eliminate the black attack. Anyway, I kind of feel like the rest of the game is maybe not so relevant, but there are only a few more moves, so let's just go for it quite quickly. You know, again, Black should really just go ahead with his own attack with rook a3 and try to attack down the h-file, but instead g6 is a little bit of a weird move, which gave White the time to consolidate with bishop g2, and now... You know, white just has full control once again. The bishops are just very, very strong. Bishop b2, setting up this kind of thing. And, you know, even though black is taking a whole lot of pawns here, it's just not really enough. You know, queen e3, rook e1. You can see just how strong white's initiative is here. That queen g3, bishop e5. The black piece just getting kicked everywhere. And now, after queen h4, rook e4, finally we see that the knight is lost due to the fork. And after queen g5, rook b takes b4. Knight e3, queen f3, ultimately black is just down two pieces, and after knight g2, queen g2, queen c1, king h2, rook d5, rook b to c4. Uh, Artemi have resigned here because of the fork on the queen and on the c7 pawn, and of course why is two pawns up regardless. So this was a game that today was quite exciting, by far, uh, far from being a perfect game, but still white managed to win, and we got to see very clearly what white is aiming for with this very direct uh, queen side attack when black castles long in these positions, which is a good plan to keep in mind if they do play this bishop g4 knight c6, which doesn't let us get in such an easy d4 and c4 if they play it in this way. But still quite a pleasant line for white, yeah? So let's now move on to uh, the next system here in the uh, in the Karakhan, and here I'm going to suggest something actually quite different to what I've suggested in other resources in the past. So up to e4 and c6, well, in the past I've often recommended moves like knight c3 or knight f3 as different shortcuts, the two knights variation. But here I'm going to suggest a slightly more mainline approach, because this is after a little bit more of an advanced video. And the line that's sort of the main trend at high levels is the advanced variation with e5. And the idea of the advanced Karakhan is that it basically compares favorably to the advanced French. The reason I didn't recommend the advanced variation against d5 in this particular video is because after c5 black does get some very fast pressure against this pawn but we can see that in this version here after e5 that the move c5 would take an extra tempo for black and black also hasn't played the move e6 in this version which means you get some extra options such as playing dc5 and potentially trying to hang on to the pawn or actually the modern trend these days is to actually give back the pawn where move like a3 where you just kind of let them take and just develop your piece in this kind of way. We're very harmonious setup if uh, if permitted for white. And Fury does consider white to have a small advantage in these types of positions. Due to the fact that, of course, black is playing a French with tempo down in a certain sense. But anyway, the main move black is to play bishop f5. And this is what happened in our game between Vichy Anand playing against Jan Christoph Duda in the uh, Blitz uh, tournament of Zagreb 2021. And now the main line here is to go knight f3 and play this short system with uh, just developing the king side naturally. But again, it's a line which is, of course, black is going to be most ready for this of all the options at white's disposal. It has a lot much of a, a lot higher workload. So I recommend it in the club play to expert repertoire course that is in my uh, store of courses. Well, I think the move h4, the tile variation, is perhaps one that may be more appealing to the average YouTube uh, viewer. Because it's more attra attacking and it's a bit more trappy. For example, the move e6 is of course a big blunder because of a Noah's Ark's trap with e g4. And I remember that the 
computers of the early 1980s and 1970s would often fall for this because they would not realize in time that the that the bishop is getting trapped, you know, with h5 and the bishop has no square. But of course, we should also consider what happens if black doesn't just blunder a piece like this. So due to play to move h5 in the game, which I consider to be the most reliable continuation. But what if they play h6 instead? What do you think is the follow-up for white in this case? So, well done if you came up with the move of g4. Oh, that g4, h4 doesn't really make that much sense. But here the point is that, let's say, they play bishop e4 and you know, try and provoke a weakening f3 move before tucking back to h7. Well, now the whole point of white's play is that we can disrupt black's normal development. Uh, and we do this by playing the move e6. So, we are sacking a pawn when playing the tile variation. But the point is that if they take it and... Probably to be fair, they shouldn't take it, but if they do, the idea is we go bishop d3 and suddenly black's got a lot of weaknesses on the king side, and we see it because of the pawns on e6 and e7, that it is very difficult for black to develop the bishop from f8. And if black plays bishop takes d3, well then the queen comes in and suddenly queen g6 is a threat. We also even have ideas such as bring the knight to f4 to attack e6 and g6. Sometimes you'll even see moves like pawn to f4, trying to clear the way for knight f3, knight e5. And given that black is not able to really develop these kingside pieces in a convenient way, it means that even though black is currently up a pawn, in a certain sense he's playing effectively two pieces down from this position. Unless he does something very radical to change his structure, you know, like playing e5 and just giving the pawn back. But even then, black is still considerably worse in this position. So, in any case, that's sort of the basic idea of white's play. Uh, black can play with bishop d7, trying to reverse back to a French where these moves might look a bit weakening. But actually it turns out the space gain is quite useful for white and after knight c3, e6 bishop b3, white just kind of gets a much better version of a usual uh, Steinitz variation of the French that I sort of hinted at at the start of this video, where obviously, you know, the bishop is not really great on d7, black's g8 knight really struggles to find a good square, and it's even not so easy to get c5 when white can simply play dc5 supported by the bishop. That's why we played bishop e3 before. So that's why I think the move h5 is the strongest one in this position. And again, the nice thing is there are quite a few different ways you can play this position as white. So the way that Anand played it with bishop d3 trading the bishops is the modern main line. Uh, saying that after bishop d3, queen d3, you get a bit of a lead in development to work with. But there are also other approaches. Uh, the move bishop g5 is one tricky line where you kind of sack the pawn with bishop d3 and... There can be some fun lines, let's say, where, you know, you sack a rook as well with e6 to get this really big attack, but it's not a line I can recommend, unfortunately, because I think after queen d4 that, you know, the idea is bishop f5, queen e5, you just don't really get enough of the material there in my experience. So it's more of a trappy line, but not really that effective. Uh, the old main line and maybe the more positional approach is to play the move c4 and kind of say that with the inclusion of h4, h5, that in certain positions you get the g5 square for your pieces. Although modern theory consists to be not so dangerous, but there are some ways you can play it where often you'll end up with this dc4, bishop c4 structure, where you do get a nice space advantage, even if objectively it's still about equal. But yeah, we're going to be focusing on bishop d3 here, because that's the move that Anand played in the game. After takes, takes, and e6. Uh, there is also a move queen a5 that is kind of interesting, but... Well, you can either play it as in the game, which is knight d2, and actually it's very likely to transpose after e6 and, uh, and knight g to f3, as it were. Uh, there are also some other fun lines, like b4 is a kind of interesting pawn sack that's been popular lately, but that's sort of a more advanced uh, thing to, if you want to explore a gambit approach. But okay, black goes e6, and well, in the past, the way that people used to play this was to go bishop to g5. And then if they go queen b6, knight d2, and you basically were sacrificing the b2 pawn, but getting quite a nice attack with rook b1, c4, and a very fast development. And it's still quite a fun line where if black makes one mistake, you could easily get potentially a winning position out of the opening. But there's also other approach to black, like bishop e7 and knight h6, where they just try to play more solidly. And again, there are a lot of plans for it, like knight c3 or knight d2, or you know, whether they take h6 or not or whether to play c4, or to play c3. So you can see it's pretty easy to find something that's to your taste, and perhaps white does have a very small edge in this line as well. But in the game, Anand plays knight f3, which maybe is a bit more likely to surprise your opponents, and I don't think it's necessarily an inferior move either. 
Uh, and the idea is if black would have developed normally, we're often going to hit with a move like c4 and just kind of get that nice initiative in the center. So due to place a move of queen a5, which is sort of aimed against this, uh, this c4 break to some extent. Although if black does play queen a6, well, you can play c4 anyway, making sure that the queens stay on the board. And with something like castles, b3, bishop, b2, you're just going to have a very pleasant advantage. In fact, you have more space. And that because the insertion of these pawn moves is not so easy for black to castle, because then the h5 pawn becomes a target and knight g5 also can potentially be quite annoying in some lines to build up the attack. I realize I've drawn a Picasso painting with the arrows, but I think you get the idea. I right, will instead do to play some move knight h6 and tries to play it without the move queen a6. But then it kind of raises the question, well, why did you play queen a5 in the first place if you're not playing queen a6? Black went for the move bishop to e7 at this point, which I think is actually a little bit imprecise. And probably I would have instead gone for the move knight f5, trying to put some pressure on the center. Because it kind of asks white, well, what is your follow-up going to be? Because if white goes c4, well, black can now play bishop to e7, and okay, it actually ends up transposing into the game. But knight f5 also has the point if white does play a different setup, let's say with knight to b3. Well, black can then play the move queen to a6 and kind of trade the queens without allowing the possibility of c4 by comparison. And if white does keep the queens on the board, well, you're giving black time to prepare the c5 break without white having to move c4 to open up the center for his development. And it's a general principle that if black can get in the move c5 without allowing c4 by white, then in general he equalizes in these positions. Okay, maybe you can argue dc5 can still try to play for a small edge, but I think black can be reasonably okay okay with his chances compared to, let's say, the other possibilities. Well, black goes bishop e7. Again, maybe the best bet is to go knight b3 just to make it harder for him to get in c5, but Anand goes c4, which is thematic, but I do think that from a theoretical perspective, this is probably just fine for black. As having to play g3 kind of admits that, okay, we didn't really get anything special out of the opening, especially if black would have cast, I think that black is, at the very least, not worse with, say, knight d7, rook d8. Here we can gradually prepare the c5 break to a good moment, yeah? While white has a little bit of a hard time developing the queen side to good squares. But black went knight a6 instead, and unfortunately for Duda, his attempt to play very creatively kind of backfired here. Uh, white could also go a3, just trying to kill the knight a bit, but white played a move b3 instead. We had rook to d8, bishop to b2. And yeah, now the move c5 was sort of just quite fine for black. Okay, and I did go on to win the game in just 28 moves, so... While I don't think his next move is necessarily the most precise, still he was able to make it work. I'm not sure about cd5. I think that letting black get in rook d5 and attack this does give black quite a strong initiative. But instead, Duda maybe overthought things a bit and played the move knight to b4, which kind of gives white maybe a little bit more of what he wants. Um, again, after queen e4, black really should play rook d5, but instead he went knight d5 for some reason. Uh, we had knight to c4. Queen a6, and yeah, after d takes c5, well, the structure is still definitely quite uh, quite fine for black, but somehow black, again, just refused to castle his king until it was too late. Well, I mean, after king h2, I think if black just castles, his position is just at least equal, maybe even slightly better in this case. But instead, black plays his move b5, I think just asks a little bit too much of the position, at least the way that Duda played it here, where he played this move at knight to b4, trying to... I guess, go for knight d3 and fight for the initiative. The problem with this is that white now has a very nice retreat, which is what knight did in the game, queen to e2. And after queen e2, black continued his plan of knight c2, trying to win material, but unfortunately he missed white's next move. Um, Actually, to be fair, there's probably several good moves, like even rook c1 is quite good here. But well done if you found the even better move, as in Anand's move knight e4. Which actually is just completely winning, because after knight a1, knight c5, well, queen a2, rook a1 doesn't just win the knight, but actually traps the queen. And after knight, queen c6, rook c1, you know, the knight is simply lost at this point. So the game ended castles, knight e4, queen b6, rook takes a1, and okay, I guess the only reason black didn't resign already is because it was a blitz game, but after rook c8, knight fg5, you know, we're threatening to take this pawn g6, knight f6, king g7, and knight d7 also just forks the queen and rook to win the exchange. White will be up a piece after taking the rook, and so Duda resigned here. Okay, admittedly it's true that in terms of the opening, that white didn't really get anything out of the opening, but it's also true that 
there are quite a few different ways you can play these positions. That, for example, from a theoretical perspective, playing knight b3, and then just retreating the queen when they offer the trade is probably the way to keep a keep a small advantage here. Say queen d1, and then you know you can kick the queen away and and still play using the fact that you know black is not find it so easy to find a safe refuge for his king and to get in the move c5 in a good version. Okay, to be fair, these decisions are quite strategically complex, and of course, one game can't do it full justice. But I do think that with some of these ideas that you are going to have more comfort with this h4 line in your opponents. In any case, let's move on to what is our final game, and I sort of deliberate over whether to include coverage of some of the sidelines, but I then figured it is worth seeing how to deal with moves like d6, g6, and knight f6. Because while they're not as common as the lines we've seen before, they do have their right to exist, and certainly... The thing care subs in particular, like G6, are seen more often in blitz online blitzes maybe than in over-the-board play. Uh, before I do show you this game between Serrano and Onishuk, I do want to quickly point out that if Black does play to move Knight to F6 in this position, that this is the Alican defense, and a quite good answer to this is to play D4, D6, and the old main line is to play Knight F3, but then you still have to know how to deal with D5, Bishop G4, G6... There are a lot of moves that you kind of have to be ready for to kind of make this work as white. Whereas a more lazy kind of option is to play the move c4 and to play the exchange variation with e takes d6. Which granted maybe doesn't give you as big an advantage as f4 to 4 pawns attack does here. But it's quite easy to play, you know, after cd6. One step that's actually quite interesting here, uh, and it's suggested by the computer at a high depth, is to throw in a4, kicking the knight away, and if they avoid that with a5... Well, then we can play like knight f3 and just play like bishop e2. Sort of making the point that, yeah, they get b4 for the knight, but we also got b5 for our knight. So if you want to approach it's kind of not really very theoretical at all, but one where you can try to set some fresh problems. Well, then this is kind of an interesting idea. You know, you can even play knight a3, bring knight toward b5, and black doesn't really manage to get such great pressure on this d4 pawn when knight b5 is allowing us to... You know, to simply defend it very easily, as it were, at some moment. It's a D5 is also meant to be quite good, just grabbing the space. But anyway, it's a land you can explore on your own. It's kind of a, let's say, a very original approach compared to the usual Knight C3, Bishop E3, and this kind of stuff that one normally sees as the old main line. And if they play ED6, then again, like Knight C3, you can just play Bishop D3, Knight E2, Castles, and Black ends up being left with this Knight B6. It really doesn't do very much if we compare it to a Petrov structure, for example, where knight would normally be on f6 or on e4, let's say. <clears throat> well, anyway, the instead of this, of course, the game Serana on it should continue with d6, and, well, the minor we'll see in the game is known as the Piotr's defense with knight f6, knight c3, and g6, but if they play without knight f6, the same stuff we're going to see in the game, as in the Austrian attack with f4, knight f3, it will also work if black decides to play, let's say, g6 and, you know, play it in this way. I mean, in this position after f4, black really does not have better than the move knight to f6, transposing back to the period's defense into the game. Because if black plays c6, that's just way too passive, and, you know, knight f3. I'll make the moves on the board, actually. Knight f3, bishop e3. I mean, this is just very, very comfortable for white. We're just going to go queen d2, long castles. We don't really care if they double our pawns because we have such a big lean development that it really doesn't matter. And if they play some move like a6 going for b5, then... I mean, it's very easy just to go knight f3, b5, bishop d3, and, well, I'll show you the same line that I recommended in the uh, in my play e4 like Ikara course, where I recommend just to play a4, kick away that pawn with a4, b4, knight e2, and then we're ready to meet c5 with c3, just building a very strong wall of pawns or a strong chain of pawns where it's easy you say the castle to develop and just have a very pleasant advantage with your extra space it's really not hard to understand the you know why white is better in such a position yep so let's return to the game which was e4 d6 d4 knight f6 and i think you know by now the move that we are playing in this position as in the move f4 uh by the way they do have this move e5 i don't think you're going to face that often, but they can try to transpose into the Philidor defense. And in this case, well, after knight f3, knight d7, I have a bit of a soft spot for this very attacking line with rook g1, where you just go g4, g5. It's a nice little shortcut, which seems to be setting a lot of problems for black at the grandmaster level lately. You know, typically you're just going to play like bishop e3, 
If you're going to you know, Castle Long, go H4, G5. It's all very systematic attacking ideas for white. Um, so it's a pretty easy system to play. Because uh, I think that the lines where you go and trade queens are a little bit dry and don't really give you that much of an edge. But if you like end games, there's a good alternative for white. Uh, but anyway, the game saw G6, F4, Bishop G7, Knight to F3. And here, the move castles is what Onishuk played. Um, if they play C5, I find that both Bishop B5 and DC5 work quite well. But it's a line that you tend to see a lot more at a much higher level of play. I think at the club level or the online level, you're unlikely to see it. But these are both good moves you can explore if you are so inclined. Uh, but after castles... Well, in my play for like Ikara, of course, I know it's not the first time I mention it. But in the course, I recommend the move E5, which is sort of a very dangerous attacking system where in many lines you can go h4 h5 and get a big attack on the king you can check out the link in the description to get that course into master this very dangerous approach but the main line in practice and probably the best move if we're talking purely objectively is the move bishop d3 that serana played in the game it does require you to be ready for a few different subs for black but fortunately the only really two decent option black either play knight a6 which we'll see in the game or to play knight to c6 and try to push in the center. But after knight c6, I find that the move e5 works quite well. You just don't let them gain the move e5. And after d5, just have interest which way would you take back on e5 if you were white. So the old main line is to play fe5. But then after knight h5, black does get some counter play against our center. And we do have to be quite precise to prove any advantage. Whereas I find that d takes e5 is maybe a slightly easier route to an edge, where we just keep that sort of symmetrical structure, and then after knight d5, I find that the move of... Well, there are actually a few different approaches. In the past, I used to think that bishop d2 was the best move, but now I would probably change my mind a little bit and say that maybe just castling is the way to go. You know, we let them double our pawns, but on the other hand, we also kind of stop them getting a knight d4 counterplay. Meanwhile, we, you know, we can just play bishop e3... Moves like rook b1, knight d4, queen e2, all just very natural development. And this space advantage offered by pawn e5 just gives us a small but very pleasant pull. And as I said, there are other good moves like bishop d2, knight d5. I think all these moves will give white a small advantage, so it really is a matter of taste. Whether you want to keep the tension or whether you want to release the tension in this sort of position. Uh, if you do play knight d5, you probably want to follow up with queen e2. Because that will allow you to go bishop g e4 in some lines and kind of kick the queen out of its active post. For a small advantage. So that I guess explains why Onishuk played the move Knight A6 in this title Tuesday Blitz game from 2021. However, in this case, after Castles, well, the idea of Knight A6 is that Black wants to be able to take back with Knight takes C5 because if Black had to take back with a pawn, White would just get an E5 and get a very similar structure to what we saw after Knight C6, but in a much better version for White, yeah? So, instead we should play d5 and just make it a Benoni structure, or more precisely a Schmidt Benoni structure. Where, okay, we played the move f4 and they played the knight a6, so neither side got the perfect setup, but still white should have some advantage with the extra space. If they play rook b8 and try to prepare c5, I find that a quite nice move is to play king h1, just kind of a move we kind of saw in some Grand Prix attack lines as well. We might have a certain similarity, but where the pawn is on d5 instead of d3, which is certainly a much better version for us. If they go knight c7, we just have a4 and we just make it very hard for them to get in the b5 break. And if they do prepare it, well, we've got ideas of our own. I mean, you can play queen e2 to hold back b5 and you're certainly preparing moves like e5 or f5 to try to, you know, go for a king's high attack or go for initiative in the center. Obviously, depending also on what black does as well, but this is the general plan to fight in this structure. So instead, black goes bishop g4. Because a common problem for black in these positions is bishop struggles to find a really active square. So it does make some sense to try to recycle it. Uh, Serrano just plays the move h3 trading the bishop. Uh, there are some other good moves as well. But this is just to show you how these positions can typically play out. And certainly having the bishop pair is a nice added bonus. That, you know, if black does try to play e6 at some point to open up and challenge a center. Then having the bishop pair definitely means it will be in white's favor in general. So black goes knight c7 and actually after a4... He does indeed play the move of e6 trying to challenge the center since we already saw this plan of playing for b5 is a little bit too slow. Uh, well, actually, no, black doesn't play e6. He plays the move a6, but e6 maybe was the better move. But in that case, we can take, take, and, and then a move like f5 is quite a nice idea in some positions, just opening up the bishops. 
You can also build up more slowly with queen e1 and moves like bishop d2, bishop c4, rook d1. And that'll also give white a clear advantage. Black center might look nice, but it's kind of hard to get in d5 in a good version, because white can kind of just ignore it and just keep building up the position. So, in the game, Gert goes a6, and now it's a good moment to see if you can find a very strong positional idea with white to play here. So when black plays a move a6, a very strong reply, which is quite well known from the 1d4 openings, by the way, is to play the move a5. And then do a5 is if they go b5, we simply take on Passant, and black doesn't get those pawns side by side in the queen side, which is what black's dream would be in this structure, yeah? So now Onishuk plays a move e6, but we see here that this structure, again, is just very, very pleasant for white. We already talked a little bit about the fe6 structure and how that can play out, but... In the game, black goes knight takes e6, and here it's apparently very strong for white just to go f5 and say, well, I don't even care that you get the e5 outpost because, well, if knight d7, white can go knight d5, kick this knight out, and the attack is a bit too strong on the uh, on the king side with the space and the bishops and the development, yeah? But even though bishop e3 by Strana is not the most precise, it still gives white a pretty big advantage. Now, probably black should try to change the position with some b5 or d5 break here, but instead of black goes knight d4, rook f1. Uh, we don't want to give up our strong bishop when they have their Fienkero bishop in principle. Uh, the game continues rook to e8. White just plays queen d2, just continuing to develop very naturally. And after knight c6, it finally occurs to Serana this very strong idea that is actually quite close to winning. Not the first time we've seen it, but it turns out that f5 is incredibly good. In this position, just preparing bishop g5 and knight d5 to just bring all the pieces to bear on this knight. And like I said, if black does move the knight, well, still you can play moves such as knight d5. You're not afraid of bishop b2 because then, you know, you get the pawn back anyway and you still have a, a monster initiative as white. So, in the game, black played rook e5 and white played bishop g5. The piece just flooding into the attack and we can see that at this point, after the move bishop to f4, that white is just completely winning. Apparently f6 is even better, just completely trapping in that bishop on h8, where it just completely entombed, but okay, the game saw bishop f4 is still a completely winning move. And after the move, rook a8, and you're hoping maybe for some glimmer of hope that black can hold with the knight on e5. It's not very realistic, especially after white's move f6 that basically just completely squashes any attempt at resistance since, you know, bishop h8 runs into bishop h6. Even winning the queen, it reminds of when you see a good move look from a look for an even better one by Emmanuel Lasker. So black goes knight takes f6 instead, but then bishop takes e5, and what we all see is that white actually just wins a full rook because uh, of the fact that the knight on f6 is now under attack by the knight and the rook, as well as of course the bishop. After knight d5, white throws in the intermediate move bishop g7, and after takes e d5, queen to f d4. Queen to f2, black goes knight e5, and after queen takes d4, obviously the queens are coming off, and white is a whole rook up, and therefore Onishuk resigned here, giving Serana the win. So there you have it, that was the coverage of the alternatives, giving you a very strong repertoire against these g6 and d6 lines based on the Austrian attack with f4 and knight f3. We've seen that the ideas are pretty easy for white to play and pretty easy to understand, and they also give white a very nice advantage as well in all of the lines. So that being said, congratulations, you've completed this lone E4 series in terms of dealing with all of the sidelines. We saw, you know, how to deal with E6 as well as C6 and the Scandinavian, and of course the sidelines indicated by the arrows here on the board. So you're now ready to play E4. Do make sure to comment below what, uh, and how confident you are now playing E4 after watching this video. And I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Uh, by the way, also, if you haven't already, make sure to hit that red subscribe button for more of these Grandmaster Chess videos, because subscribing is the easiest way to become a better chess player. All right, see you in the next one. Get out of here.